day 634 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, once again, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 318,000 military personnel losses. Then as for hardware losses, so 13 tanks, 25 APVs, and a not so whopping 18 artillery today. But incredibly, uh, two multiple launch rocket systems and two air defense systems. And I'll certainly show you guys some of those examples shortly as well. Then we'll head across to the map and start out in Russia. As Moscow's mayor said that their air defenses uh, intercepted a drone in the capital. Now, this information couldn't be uh, independently verified, but it does sound like a, a single AFU reconnaissance drone, or perhaps a Ukrainian drone performing air defense tests, which, if true, would be particularly embarrassing to Russia, because not only did the, the drone make it all the way to Moscow, it also made it to Moscow's northeastern district, which is 8 kilometers or, or just 5 miles from downtown Moscow city itself. And as a result, it's very much news like this that leads us to always point out the irony of the situation as it relates to Russia, who is meant to have the, the best air defense systems in the world. So we ask Russia the question, what air defense doing? Then we move to Russia's exclave region of Kaliningrad. Now, here it is all the way over there, where a woman set fire to an army enlistment office. And she didn't even wait for it to be dark to perform the act, although uh, local police have not caught her yet. And so these types of events have not been uncommon in Russia since the announcement of the SMO. And add to that, on many occasions, women have uh, indeed been the perpetrators of these events. And at least in one scenario, it was a Russian babushka who was therefore clearly immune to Russian propaganda. So, so there still is hope. Then we'll head back across to the Ukrainian map today. Uh, start out in the Donbass. So there's, as there's been a few bits and pieces of updates here in the last day. So starting out in Bakhmut, uh, in its northwest, there was a small uh, expansion of the Ukrainian forces recorded, although this may in fact have been a clarification for frontline updates. Then just south of Bakhmut, so whoop, here we go. As Russia made a, a southern uh, push from the, the very northerly settlement of Kreshchivka, as it went from a bit of a, a pocket gray zone, and I'll see if I can show that there. There we go, oh, over the last two days, uh, to a, all the way up to the, the, the train line but also an expansion there just below the Ukrainian high point. But also, around the same time, Ukrainian defenses, uh, defense forces repelled Russian assault uh, attempts near to central Kshivka as well. So certainly not a dull day in this region. Also then, a bit further south, so there was an update or clarification showing that Ukraine actually uh, expanded their frontline control of this position uh, just east of Shumi. Again, a clarification, but it was more than it was uh, assumed to be uh, just a couple of days ago. Then across to Abdivka, as a, a Russian armored uh, assault southwest of the town ended in at least three destroyed armored vehicles, including uh, one turret toss. Also, uh, another Russian, Mr. S, SPG, was eliminated and was reportedly struck by a, a single guided HIMARS rocket somewhere around here on the Avdivka front. And being that it was acting as a stationary artillery piece, it was likely to be somewhere at least 5 to 10 kilometers behind the front lines, probably even a smidge more. But still a lot of activity here, because also on the northern flank, Russian forces somehow lost their front line positions that uh, previously went all the way up to the, the railway line right here. But then in some back and forth engagements, the uh, 
Russian forces made a discernible 500 meter or so push just south of Vesele. Then add to that uh, something of a bulge or a, a salient push at the, uh, the eastmost point of the region. So in fact, right here, consistent with the, the red arrow on the map, uh, as Russia seeks to likely make some of their final pushes before the winter freeze which is sometimes referred to as the solidification of front lines for the winter period. Although I'm, I'm quite interested to see how this winter plays out because, well, where the front lines are concerned, Russian frontliners will go into a sort of survival mode, as they did last year, as they, in many instances, will be dealing with literally staying alive from the harsh, cold winter conditions. As meanwhile, the AFU will not only be more incredibly well equipped this winter from a, a variety of metrics, uh, that includes clothing, weaponry, and importantly, very well orchestrated uh, underground and cozy warm bunkers, which is just in absolute stark contrast to frontline Russians and their positions, as they will mostly be dealing with uh, open trench systems exposed to the elements directly. So we're certainly very likely to see a few more Russian defectors, specifically due to these conditions uh, for this winter. Oh, and then just lastly for this region. So a photo emerged in the last day of a, a Russian Tor M2 SAM air defense system that sits destroyed after a Ukrainian SEAD strike. So for instance, an AGM-88 missile, which is a high-speed anti-radiation missile designed specifically to destroy these machines. And you might notice this uh, air defense system is, is quite large. Reason being, uh, it's called a Attila air defense system, which incorporates the transporter, the launcher, the radar, uh, the communication systems all into one neat and tidy package, which actually ends up making for one very high value target worth around 25 million US dollars. In fact, I've uh, seen previous footage of a $400 Ukrainian FPV drone making light work of one of these before. Then we'll head into the southern uh, front lines and regions here today as the AFU expanded their uh, zones with more area liberated in the uh, east of Robotina. Also, in some welcome news for the AFU and possibly some cutting edge related news, so Ukrainian drone operators destroyed a Russian giant Sint S which is a, a long-range artillery platform, and reportedly the Ukrainian forces did so with some new kind of kamikaze drone that took out this Russian SPG from way behind the front lines. Now, as for this new drone, mysterious drone that's been fielded, it's, uh, well, I'm quite sure we'll get some more details on that one soon, but it's likely to be longer ranged with a, a larger payload and faster, you know, FPV drone of sorts. Then we'll move right across next door to Kherson, so where it seems Ukrainian pressure uh, is paying dividends, as Russia has to now deal with uh, multiple simultaneous forward movements by the AFU. So starting off, there are reports of 20 Russian soldiers deserting along the front line on the outskirts of Krinky. But also, for good measure, here's some uh, quick footage of uh, some AFU soldiers walking within the town. Then, also further east, uh, leading closer to the Kovkovka Dam at the Dnipriani settlement, Ukraine actually initiated an attack which shows a further widening of the Kherson bridgehead. Then, as for this region, uh, not to be outdone by the other regions today, so a, a Russian TOS-1A thermobaric multiple rocket launcher system was destroyed by something called a Baba Yaga uh, agri-drone. Now, these fearsome beasts are large unmanned hexacopters that can carry a wide variety of large payloads, for instance, so they can carry up to six of the RPG-7 projectiles and other ammunition such as the 82mm uh, or 120mm mortar mines. 
But back to the TOS 1A destruction, as we've seen these Russian platforms get taken out with increased regularity uh, in the past few months, which has become something of a problem because they cost about 6 million US dollars a piece for Russia. They're also in short supply by Russia with uh, them having only about 45 as of the beginning of the war last year. Then of course, add to that, their pitiful 6 km or about 3.8 mile range makes them extremely vulnerable to AFU drones and therefore turning them into an expensive paperweight for this war. Then we'll move across on the map, uh, we'll head south today into the Russian occupied Crimean Peninsula as we've received some images and reports of uh, Russia moving some of their air defense systems like the S-300s and the reloads for the, the book systems uh, out of Crimea to mainland Russia, in fact all the way to Novorossiysk, which is a location that will overtake Sevastopol at some point as Russia's main port for their, their Black Sea fleet. You see this distance right here, and I'll use the ruler for this one. So this distance was once a chasm for Ukrainian weapons to cross by air or sea, but that's just no longer the case, as Ukraine, Ukraine can cross this divide with, with relative ease now, effectively putting Russia's Crimean HQ on notice. And so, as a result, it seems that at least some elements of the Russian Navy are aware of the risks of keeping naval vessels stationed here. And hey, as an added bonus for Putin, due to the pullback of some of those uh, Russian air defense systems, this might end up giving a little bit extra protection uh, for Putin's palace. And uh, let's zoom right in for that one. I'm quite sure it is. There it is, hiding there. Hard to see. In fact, if I switch to satellite, you're not going to see a lot. But back to reality, as Russia should actually be incrementally bolstering their air defense systems in Crimea and not the other way around. Then we'll head across to some news for today. So starting out, the Netherlands has made room for 2 billion euros of aid to Ukraine for their 2024 budget. Small country, big box. Also related to this news, the, the Dutch defense minister stated, quote, with this significant amount, we are sending a clear signal. Ukraine could and can continue to count on us. Then moving to the flip side with some Russian hardware related news. So it's been reported that uh, the 1 million or so shells sent from North Korea to Russia have been having a number of problems, uh, being a case of quantity over quality. As it's been noted on the Russian side that a significant portion of these shells, these artillery shells, have not been fitting properly uh, or leaving gaps uh, in the barrels that have led to explosions of those artillery barrels. You see, you only need a, a slight gap uh, in the, the barrel for, for gases to escape on the sides of the shell instead of creating a, a tight uh, underneath thrust, which can cause the barrel to, to split and literally blow up. Somewhat like a, a cartoonish uh, explosion, like a, a cigarette or, or a cigar on the face. And this is just another example of how the, the daily lost numbers, those updates, can wildly be considered a conservative figure because there's no way that we can fully account for, for what's actually happening on the Russian side, uh, except well, but to know that it's, uh, it's happening. And as such, it looks like North Korea's Kim Jong-un didn't give away his most recently manufactured stuff. Then moving across to some more news. So Igor Gherkin has announced from prison that he will be running for president in the Russian 2024 elections. Now this guy has a, a rap sheet longer than I can ever mention, but I will give it a try. So he's the former defense minister of the Donbass, uh, known for leading Russian forces during Crimea's annexation and, and being implicated as a war criminal in the 2014 MH17 shooting down in Crimea. And he was also recognized for his open criticism of Russian military operations. Eventually, Putin was fed up with him, and thus uh, this guy was extracted from his literal podcasting hole 
in the Donbass and then uh, was proceeded to be, well, well, imprisoned in Russia. But will he be president of Russia next year? <laughs> no, that's not plausible. That's just not going to happen. Although his motivations for making such an announcement would likely be to make a political statement and ruffle the Putin feathers a bit and try to influence uh, political discourse as well. I mean, this guy is rotting in a, a Russian jail cell right now, so he doesn't have much else to lose at this stage, except for maybe the risk of having a, a tea-induced heart attack followed by somehow falling out of a prison window. Then, in some more Russian baby maker news, let's call it that. So, uh, as Russia is increasingly living under the, the threat of a demographic collapse, which is only exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, so Russia's latest solution that is that uh, from a member of the State Duma, who's proposed that Russia should uh, release some 50,000 imprisoned women in Russia and cancel the rest of their sentence, provided that they conceive a child. You see, Russian problems require Russian solutions. I mean, hey, normally immigration could be a solution for this, or even incentivizing Europeans, for instance, with some sweet benefits. That could do the trick. But nobody wants to move to Russia. Nobody. Now more than ever. Then, as for some news uh, out of Kazakhstan, so authorities in Kazakhstan have shut down the Sputnik 24 service, known for broadcasting television channels controlled by the, the Russian state. All in what's seen as an increasingly hostile stance from Kazakhstan to Russia. For instance, recently the president of Kazakhstan, Tokiev, has made it clear that Kazakhstan will not recognize occupied territories within Ukraine. They've also provided uh, a bunch of humanitarian uh, aid to Ukraine. Uh, also, more recently, uh, Tokiev snubbed Russia as during a meeting with uh, a Russian delegation that did include Putin, he chose to speak Kazakh, uh, e even though he speaks Russian fluently. Also, Tokiev has been uh, quite against using his country to avoid economic sanctions as well, so not allowing Russia really to do so. So you see, this former Soviet state that continued to have very good political and economic ties with Russia for the past 30 years is clearly starting to change their tune on the world stage. Then moving across to a final funny to round it all off for today, guys, uh, and uh, the, the hypocrisy of this one I find quite funny, so here we go. As the, the press secretary of the Russian Federation, uh, Dmitry Peskov, was recently talking about his daughter Liza and how she lived in very humble Spartan conditions in France during her studies. But the internet has been very quick to point out several images of her very, shall we say, challenging lifestyle in the country. Which included expensive cars, private jets, spacious apartments, and designer clothes. Which is just so typical of a Russian oligarch's offspring uh, that studies abroad. But it's all about framing, isn't it? I mean, we could say that she was forced to drive a car without a roof, drink old wines, eat moldy cheese and fish eggs, and then pretty quickly you start to feel sorry for her. And so ultimately, you're going to be very hard pressed to find the children of any press secretary elsewhere on the global stage living in these kinds of lavish conditions. And I'm sure this wealthy Russian oligarch that is Peskov has also been earmarked for some later ICC or The Hague treatment later down the track as well. So that will be it for today, guys. Uh, thanks again for watching. Please leave a comment, subscribe, and uh, yeah, hit the old like button. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.